Hi, and welcome to episode number 69 of the weekly Google Cloud Platform podcast. I am Francis Campoy, and I'm here with my colleague, Mark Mandel. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? I am very good. I feel relaxed after, you know, Cloud Next is over. And yeah. Now, yeah, we don't have anything to do, right? It's uh, just, I just nap now. That's and, just what I do. And Google I.O. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, nothing. Not, we, we're cool. We're cool now. And we have today a very cool interview with one of our customers. Uh, so we're going to have Davey Mitten from uh, Server Density. We'll see exactly what they do. They do not do ser dense servers. Uh, there was a joke there, but we did. <laughs> uh, they, they basically build like uh, a logging, a monitoring logging solution, mm -hmm. and it's open source, runs on Google Cloud Platform, and they had a very interesting story of migrating from, um, from on-premise MongoDB to uh, Bigtable. Yep. And then after that, we will have our question of the week, where we're looking at latency times across the GCP network. Uh, where should I run my machines so my customers in this area are the happiest? Yep. Uh, we'll answer that question. But before that, we have, as usual, our cool things of the week. And I'm going to start with the one that I brought because I think it's super cool. Go on, then. Uh, this weekend, I watched a bunch of Cloud Next talks. Like we said, I was binge watching Next. Uh, and one of the talks, actually two of the talks that really blew my mind were from uh, Martin, uh, Martin Gornier, uh, Martin Gorner from our team, he gave two talks on TensorFlow. They're called TensorFlow and Deep Learning with a PhD. And it turned very well because I do not have a PhD. And it basically goes from what are the basics of TensorFlow to training a neural network with all the works of William Shakespeare and generating new William Shakespeare random, like fan fiction, you could say. <laughs> <laughs> William Shakespeare fan fiction with a Daniel network, and the result is amazing. Uh, he also uses the same technique to generate Python code. So he trains the TensorFlow neural network with the TensorFlow source code, and then he generates new TensorFlow code. It looks like it would work. It would look, in theory, -ish. Oh, yeah. I like, mean, close. It, 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 to the point that it starts with the Apache V2 license on top of the file. So, yeah. you know, like, it is actually pretty amazing. It generates code that looks like, that looks like, I could have written it, really. So, you know, I, also, I don't write that good Python. So, <laughs> I, guess <it's, laughs> I guess that's why. We, we but, probably can't judge. Yeah, yeah. It is. But uh, go check it out. Uh, it's like two hours of content. But it's definitely worth your time if you are curious about what you can do with deep learning and you want to learn from scratch and without getting too much detail into the mathematic concept behind it. You just want to know how to do it. Cool. Um, my cool thing is uh, the announcement of the data loss prevention API, which oh, yeah. I actually think is really cool. Uh, when I first actually saw this, I just saw the video and I was like, oh, that's really neat. And then I realized it was our product, in which case I was actually <laughs> really excited. So the cool thing about this is it's, a again, a predefined machine learning tool, but what it does is it will remove and sort of classify sensitive information. So social security numbers, credit card numbers, phone numbers, all sorts of other types of sensitive data. And you don't really have to do a huge amount of work for it. So you can just send it at the API, and then it'll send it back going, oh, hey, let's just redact all these things from it, which is pretty sweet. Yeah, I, I really, so I discovered this thing uh, during one of the Cloud Next keynotes. Mm -hmm. It was really cool because they show like, Oh, uh, like imagine that you're in a chat, right? And you're talking to someone and you're like, hey, I will need your, I don't know, your account number. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, this is my account number, this is my social security number, this is my uh, address, and this is how to find my children. You know, it's like, uh, maybe not give me that, but now it's already in the chat, so you're storing it. And with this, I, with this API, basically you're able to find all the things that are sensitive and filter them out so you can now give access only to the people that should be having access to this. The amazing thing is that also works on images. I don't know if you saw that. Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah, they, they have an example where they put a picture and the picture is a picture of a credit card, right? And, and the credit card, it removes only the credit card number uh, but not the name of the person because the name of the person is not considered as sensitive but yep. the credit card number is. So it is, it is really cool. It is really, really yeah, cool. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I guess that that's one of the things that you can do when you have amazing uh, deep learning with TensorFlow. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> back to the one before. And we have one more cool thing of the week. And I'm going to say that, is this really cool? No, just kidding. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> just you know kidding. how to make friends, don't you? Just kidding, just kidding. I think it's uh, it is very cool, and uh, it is pretty exciting that we have PHP seven the one on Google App Engine. Awesome. Yeah, so if PHP is your thing and you're looking to use the latest version of PHP in your App Engine apps, uh, you can now deploy PHP 7.1 on App Engine Flex. Uh, it's got built-in containers and built-in tooling there, so you can just get that up and running really, really fast, as well as using pretty much all of your favorite uh, frameworks from Laravel, Symfony, WordPress, and more. Yeah, uh, fair warning, I guess. Uh, this is an uh, App Engine flexible environment, uh, which... You know, it is pretty cool, and it is now uh, not beta. It's general availability since Cloud Next we announced that. So uh, go have a look, and if you're not into PHP, uh, you know there's some people like that. There's many other languages that you can run on App Engine Flex, so go check it out. Like if you're running Node.js or Ruby or whatever, we have uh, we have easy ways to run that code also on Google App Engine Flexible Environment. Yep, and I'll make a quick shout out. Uh, one of the people who sits next to us in the office, Brent Schaefer, he wrote the blog post. Hi, Brent. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's a really, it's a really nice blog post, and there's also a really great video in there about deploying PHP applications on App Engine. He says he listens to the podcast. Let's see if he actually does. Find out. <laughs> great. So I guess it's time to go talk to David Mitten from Server Density. Let's go do that. So I'm very, very excited today to uh, welcome our, our guest, David Mitten, CEO and co-founder of Server Density. How are you doing, David? I'm good. Yeah. How are you? Doing great. Uh, very excited about all the things that you have to tell us. Uh, I'm, I always love architecture talks, and, and I think that you have a lot to tell us about that. But before we get into all the details, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what do you do at Server Density? Yeah, sure. So... I'm the co-founder and CEO at Server Density. We are a software as a service based scalable infrastructure monitoring company. And so we help our customers save time and money by providing advanced server and website monitoring. So that's alerting, waking people up in the middle of the night when stuff's going wrong, uh, fancy graphs and integrations across all the cloud providers. And we've got some customers like the NHS with the uh, emergency response service and ambulances here in the UK and also Drupal, Firebox, and I suppose the graphing is what we're going to be talking about a bit. Cool. And like, so what do you do at Server Density? So I started the company back in 2009. So at that point, I was doing everything, um, along with my co-founder, who I was working on the design and the interface. And uh, we put a lot of time and effort into that, building our own graphing, the interface. Um, but I built the original version of the product, including our original time series database. And over the years, I've hired engineers who are actually qualified and have really written most of our uh, most of the code that I wrote in the old days. And so now I'm responsible for, I suppose, the overall company uh, vision, how we execute on things, and working on the commercial side as well as uh, dipping in here and there on the engineering. Cool. So, uh, could you tell us a little bit about what is server density uh, like? Like how it is to use it? Do you have an API and people just call for every single log line? Do you open a TCP connection? How is the, the the experience, the developer experience with server density? So there's two different parts to the product. The first one in the original use case is server monitoring, and then that's uh, complemented by availability monitoring. And with the server monitoring side of things, there's an open source agent. So I wrote the original version of that, and it's packaged up and you install it onto your servers. It runs, it executes uh, commands to pull in system statistics and ties in with all the applications that you might be running on the server. So databases, web servers, that kind of thing. And it then creates a payload in JSON, sends the data back to us over HTTPS, and that comes into uh, the server density uh, platform. From there, uh, it runs through an alerting engine. And that's where we will decide if the alerts that you've configured as a customer are going to be triggered, whether we're going to email you, SMS you, uh, send messages through to Slack or HipChat or anything like that. And then it routes it to the time series storage engine so that we can store that data for historical reporting, uh, building graphs and showing up dashboards. And then the second part is the availability monitoring. And we have locations around the world. That's where we will poll your APIs, um, public applications, endpoints, anything that's available online. We're looking at the availability and the performance. And then everything is accessible through our mobile apps, through our web interface, and also through our API. Nice. 
So、uh, one of the things that surprised me out of the whole thing that you said was you to to log stuff.、Uh, your open source agent, what it does, it says it sends JSON payload over HTTP,、uh, and I'm wondering why. Why is that? Why not like something like gRPC? Other than the fact that, of course, when you created the agent, gRPC was not a thing, but <laughs> like any、yes. other option, binaries or whatever. So the main there are two main reasons. The first one is that HTTP is a a, a very well known protocol, and outbound HTTPS because we encrypt the payload is typically available on most environments. Or if it's not directly available, then often there's a proxy. And avoiding a custom protocol means that it's very easy to convince people to open firewall rules if they need to for outbound connectivity. And then the second reason、uh, is in the early days,、uh, I didn't really know much about scaling,、uh, scaling services, scaling web services. But I did know about how to set up load balancers and to scale web. And I thought that it would be easier to scale something just by using、uh, load balancers and Apache at the time, now Nginx,、um, than inventing a custom protocol. So、uh, you talked a little bit about before. You said、uh, you, you set up the original implementation of how server density works. Can you talk us a little bit through that? I, I believe you weren't running on Google Cloud. You were doing some other different things. Yes, that's right. So there's a couple of different steps, and we、uh, have migrated a large portion of the app application over to Google Cloud. But there's still a few bits in our,、uh, our older infrastructure that's、uh, gradually being moved over over the next few months. But what I can talk about is the, how it was before, and then we can go into the, all the cool stuff on Google Cloud about how it is now. Sounds good. So, when the payload comes in,、uh, well, when it came in through our system, it goes into the intake part of the application. So this is just、uh, an endpoint, an HTTPS endpoint, and the data comes in, and that is then、uh, passed through our load balancers,、uh, which were Apache in the original days and are now running off Nginx. And that is inserted into a queuing system, which we built on top of MongoDB.、Uh, the data is stored there, and then very quickly is pulled out by the rules engine. The original version of that was in PHP. That was the the first language that I had learnt, and and it has a a bad reputation, but is incredibly versatile in being able to do stuff really quickly. So the rules engine. Uh, looks at the payload,、uh, does a quick check to make sure it's valid JSON, the account exists, the account is fully paid up and is active, and then it will pass through、uh, all the data and compare it to the alerts that are configured. And we do a number of different checks to see if an alert is already open. If it is already open, then、uh, we might not want to send another notification immediately. And、uh, there are different rules that allow us to send notifications at different times once an alert has been opened. Or waiting for a certain period of time for an alert condition to exist、uh, for a couple of minutes before we send notifications, but it's all based on customer configuration. If we decide to send a notification, then there's a separate queue, again in、uh, some MongoDB-based queue, and our notification service,、uh, which has been rewritten into Python, and、um, that was、uh, the second language that I learnt,、um, and、uh, that is what sends emails, sends SMSs. Ties into push notification gateways and sends that out to the customer, and then there's a second route, which、uh, goes into MongoDB for the time series storage as well. So that's for the graphing and the reporting. So there are these two channels: one for alerting,、um, where it goes through the rules engine, and then we discard it. And then there's a second channel where it goes into the time series format, is transformed into an optimized、uh, storage format, and then goes into MongoDB. Yeah, so this was the this was the previous implementation, right? That was running all these MongoDB instances. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And that was running on bare metal servers at Softlayer, and we had hundreds of gigabytes of RAM, many terabytes of SSDs, and it was、uh, several years worth of iterations on that that I did、um, in the very beginning、uh, to give us really really fast loading graphs for was the most commonly accessed time view, which is usually the last couple of hours. Up to the last 24 hours for customers, and then is slightly less optimized in terms of the the graph loading time for、uh, time periods going beyond that. So I'm curious now. So were you running like your own sort of shadowed MongoDB replica sets? How were you managing that? Like, was that all just a manual process? How was that managed? 
Yep, it was uh, the MongoDB replica sets with sharding. Uh, so there was a single database and a single collection in MongoDB. And um, that we, we split it out um, into different granularities. So the agent reports back every minute and we store that data every minute for, um, for a week. And then it's also at the same time written into a different database to give hourly averages. And that data is stored forever. And due to the architecture of MongoDB at the time, the uh, database level lock that they had, um, which has now been improved significantly in the latest storage engines, we split them out into different databases and sharded them separately. But aside from that being a kind of a limitation of, of Mongo, it also allowed us the benefit of being able to split them out into different clusters based on the use case, because hourly data is uh, accessed less often. And so we could have cheaper hardware to power that cluster. Cool. So you were mentioning that that is previous architecture. So what about the new one? What were the issues or what were the advantages on the new architecture that made you move? Yeah, so there were a couple of challenges and uh, we reached these, uh, I think, about a year ago. So the beginning of last year, and we got to the point where the current system was no longer scaling. Uh, in particular, we had to spend a lot of time maintaining that infrastructure. So we didn't own the servers, but they were bare metal servers and we were renting them from software and every so often we'd have disk failures or hardware failures and we'd have to deal with upgrading them. And so there was just a lot of uh, time consuming maintenance that our team had to do. We also wanted to build a lot more features and because we'd completely custom designed the uh, essentially the database schema to fit this, and the APIs, all the functionality, and the whole architecture around it. Um, it was a completely custom system, and we're a small team. We're 20 people. Majority of them are engineers, but uh, we have so many feature requests coming in that we didn't have enough time to dedicate to building uh, or spending all our time building um, time series data functionality, so things like doing maths functions, um, being able to uh, pull out data from different granularities and combine it, all the aggregations, all of these standard features that you'd expect to be able to see, we just didn't have time to build them. Then also uh, scaling was a challenge. So the replication and scaling in MongoDB is pretty good, uh, but you can't do it in a linear fashion. You have to set up an entirely new cluster um, for a new shard and then data has to move around and migrate. You've got to make sure that there's enough overhead um, to uh, to move that data. And so adding new clusters in um, was an overhead. And then finally, it's very expensive to buy all that memory and all those SSDs. And uh, it was a fun thing to say that we've got terabytes of SSDs, but uh, when you're actually looking at the overall cost, it was really expensive. Excellent. All right. So what does the new architecture look like? I think you're on GCP now. What, do you, what, what are you using? What What's connected to what? Yeah, that's right. So the time series database that was uh, MongoDB is now Cloud Bigtable. And that is running um, obviously on Google Cloud, but the intake aspect of it is still in software. It's just in a new architecture. And uh, it was about 18 months ago, uh, two years ago, that we rewrote that bit. And unfortunately, the pub sub product wasn't fully available. So we ended up having to build it ourselves on top of Kafka and Storm. So. Uh, to go back to how the data comes in, so it's coming in from the agent, it goes into that intake part again. So instead of it going into a MongoDB queue, it now goes into Kafka. So Kafka is the Apache open source project uh, queuing uh, system. That's then pulled out uh, using Storm, which is a, a big data event-based processing system. It basically gives us a framework to process all that data. The rules engine was rewritten from PHP into Python. That's the, the language that we've standardized across the whole company. And new things are, are written in Python now. And so all the rules engine um, was replicated in Python um, with a modern test suite and integration tests and everything that you'd expect from a, a properly planned and written project rather than something that I wrote and had scaled over the years. And then the notification system, again, that first route is still the same uh, with some improvements, but um, that's in Python still. And then the second route is the entirely new bit on top of Google Cloud Platform. So part of this was also, a, it's also the first bit of our migration over to Google Cloud. So we had the challenge of uh, running the primary infrastructure in software, uh, but having the time series database uh, running on Google Cloud Platform. 
And what we have to do is because the, the system is built in a microservices architecture, then we have all these APIs internally. And so it was relatively straightforward to extract this entire component, move it over to Google and have it continue to communicate over HTTPS, uh, even across the internet, which is what we did. So that second route now looks like um, just an internal API exposed over HTTPS, and that goes into the Google load balancers. That gives us the high availability and the scalability. The internal API is written in Python again, and it's just exposing the functionality. Um, it's a very light uh, wrapper on top of OpenTSDB, which is the time series database product that we use. This is open source and uh, has allowed us to solve that problem of not having enough time to build all the features that we want into the time series database because it has uh, so many different features available out of the box that we're now starting to build into the product. And we've been able to contribute a few fixes back as well because it's an open source project. And then the final part of it is that OpenTSDB is talking to Cloud Bigtable and that's where the actual storage of the data sits. Cool. Uh, tell us a little bit about how what is it, OpenTSB works and like how that whole thing kind of goes together. I'm quite curious about it. Yeah, so uh, the OpenTSDB instance is entirely stateless. So we're running that on uh, Google Container Engine. So it's uh, all shiny new containers running on Kubernetes, which was a lot of fun too uh, for our team to play around with. But it essentially uh, gives you an optimized storage format um, which is, uh, has, a, has a driver to um, store that into uh, Cloud Bigtable. And it then gives you an API to be able to query the data and has various functions so you can aggregate and perform maths functions on top of the data. Um, and it's all queried based on, uh, on tags. So this gives us all those features that we wanted um, in terms of being able to offer the graphing to our customers. And uh, how, how's the experience been in terms of being able to scale Bigtable? How's that worked for you? So the best part of it probably is that it's a completely managed service. And this was uh, one of the biggest reasons for us moving over. So at the, when I wrote the original version of our MongoDB system, I chose MongoDB because there was nothing else available. Uh, Bigtable didn't exist as a publicly available product. And uh, databases like Cassandra, which have a good reputation for time series data, um, didn't exist the first time I came to work with MongoDB. And so it gave us a, a really good product that scaled over the years uh, to have really, really fast writes. And I'm surprised at um, how well it scaled over, well, seven years really of the company existing. But it required a huge amount of my time. And then um, when we hired people, uh, it's required a lot of time internally to continue to maintain it. And so just being able to have a database product that's managed by Google, all the, um, the failover, the redundancy, the design, everything is just handled by Google so that we don't have to deal with any of that. And it's not a general purpose database. It's very specifically designed for time series data. And that means we get incredible performance from it. And that allows us to reduce the costs just because we don't need all that expensive hardware. And then specifically in terms of the scalability, uh, it's essentially linear. We know that we can get uh, 10,000 writes per second per node. And uh, we just press a button and in a couple of minutes we have a new node. And within about 20 to 30 minutes, the data has rebalanced across the entire cluster. And we've added an extra 10,000 writes. Could you share a little bit of the amount of traffic that you're doing or what's the difference in cost between running your own servers, you saying that you were owning so many SSDs, uh, to just migrating everything to Cloud Bigtable? Yeah, so the, the cost of Cloud Bigtable is a lot more predictable because we can see exactly how many writes per second we're buying for the per node cost. And uh, the graphing that uh, the Google Cloud Platform Control Panel provides uh, is, is pretty good and it just shows us the absolute numbers. That means we can see pretty easily uh, the exact number of writes that we're doing and how we need to scale it. When it came down to MongoDB in the previous architecture, it was not as transparent in terms of being able to see where we're at in, in terms of the scalability. There's no direct correlation between the number of writes and the hardware that we have. And so we had to do a lot of benchmarking and testing. And typically we would see that uh, we needed to scale through proxy metrics like the response times of the APIs rather than actually know, knowing that we're hitting the limits of the writes um, that the, the product can provide. 
Cool. So um, I'm actually curious. So we, we talked about what's seemingly all the good stuff. Uh, were there any interesting challenges or issues that you ran into moving over to GCP and Bigtable and the new architecture? Yes. So there were two interesting uh, situations that uh, we're talking about. So the first uh, time that we uh, we started the the test workload onto uh, onto Bigtable, and um, we did some tests in MongoDB and looked at the number of metrics that we were writing per second, and then simulated some test traffic into Bigtable to see uh, if that actually uh, tr was true, like the theory actually played out, and we saw that we were doing. Um, hundreds of thousands of writes per second more than we actually predicted. And that completely blew away our cost calculations because um, you get 10,000 uh, writes per second per node and you just pay per node. And it looked like we were going to go into two, 300 nodes on Bigtable, which would have been cool to say and um, was fun discussing with your engineers. But um, then we discovered that uh, OpenTSDB shipped with an outdated driver and uh, it was released before you uh, released a new batch API. And so your engineer suggested that we upgrade to a test version of the, of the driver, which we did. And in our test workload, which was doing 100,000 writes per second, uh, as soon as we switched over to the new driver, it went down to 3,000 writes per second. Uh, oh, wow. which is a pretty significant difference. And, <laughs> uh, it was uh, a big relief that our, our actual calculations were correct and our original cost projections were correct. Uh, then the second lesson that we learned from that was to do with the keys. And this is really important when you're querying the data. So the original key was based on an account ID. So every account within server density gets a unique ID. And then also the metric name. And the more items that we have um, in an account, the more data that had to be queried. And by item, I mean like a server. So if we were looking for load average, for example, uh, then the original key was to look at the account ID and then look at load average. But that would query across every single server within the account. And mm. so in our performance testing, uh, that quickly revealed that we'd made a mistake with the query, uh, with the query. Uh, the key query design and we needed it to be much more granular because for our really small accounts it was fine but for our accounts with thousands and thousands of servers the response time was just completely unacceptable and so we played around with a few different options and uh, the obvious one was just to drop in the uh, the item id in the middle so instead of it just being account id and then the metric name it became account id item id and then the metric name and that reduced query times from 30 to 40 seconds in some cases down to uh, less than a second in most cases, which is much more acceptable when you're just loading a dashboard. Yeah, nice. Uh, yeah, I guess that that is one of the things that I've heard many times about uh, Bigtable. B uh, Bigtable is, after all, a key value store. Uh, very fancy one at it, but like basically key value store. So I guess that choosing the keys is a very, very important part of it. Uh, is there any other aspects of uh, like any best practices that you may share? Something that you learn saying, hey, like this is how you should be doing keys other than what you just mentioned? Um, I think the key to designing the right uh, the key setup is uh, to actually test it. And we tested with small data sets to begin with. And it was only when we then started testing with the uh, production simulation that we discovered this performance problem which in hindsight is pretty obvious and uh, it's something that um, could easily be picked up. But it was just uh, just a simple mistake in, um, in not having a, a diverse enough testing set. And that, I suppose, is also similar to um, the problem we had with the driver in that once you start putting production workload through it, that's when it really shows up the problems. Otherwise, you would just assume just a couple of thousand writes per second as a test workload um, is, a, is a reasonably sized workload for many people. But as soon as you start pushing like actual production data through, that's when these little things will show up. Cool. All right. Well, we're, we're slowly running out of time here. Uh, is there anything we haven't asked you or anything you want to mention or plug or anything like that before we finish up? Um, so I think the only thing would be the human ops community that I, I've started and now running um, in the US and also in Europe, 
which uh, is has come out of my experiences in the early days of a server density being on call 24 hours a day for a couple of years. Um, but now more recently talking to our customers and it's a community and a series of meetups where we get companies and individuals to come along and talk about how they're running the human side of their operations. So we tend to focus on all the cool shiny tools and systems that we have in place, but don't pay enough attention to the humans that are running the systems in the sense of fatigue, getting too many alerts, all the stress of being on call and how different companies deal with that. So we've run an event in San Francisco. Um, we're doing one in April in New York and we're also running one in London. So just have a look on humanops.com. Nice. And since we're talking about events, uh, it seems like we'll see you at Cloud Next. Yes, that's right. On 8th of March, I'm going to be speaking about this, about the migration. I've got some cool architecture diagrams uh, so you can uh, visualize what I've just been talking through um, and we'll see. Um, the, I've also got the graph of uh, that change to the, the driver with a massive drop from 100,000 down to 3,000 writes per second. Sounds awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, David. That was a super interesting conversation. Excellent. Thank you. So thanks again to David for such an interesting interview. Uh, it was pretty enlightening to be able to see how someone could go from such a huge traffic running on MongoDB on-premise to migrating all of that, like basically while the, I think the, the metaphor is changing the engine on a car while it's moving or something like that. I think I people generally say train, but yeah, that works. It doesn't matter. It's a, it still works as a metaphor. On the, on the, I'd say on a train is easier because you can just replace, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not the important thing. Uh, it was a very interesting, uh, very mm. interesting thing. And if you are interested in knowing more about this, uh, this interview was recorded right before Next, but during Next, they had a very cool session called Big Table in Action, powering billion user services and meeting customers' challenges. And it is available online, so you can go check it out now. Uh, and you'll see uh, Sami Sohurdin from yeah, from Google Cloud. He's a senior solutions senior solutions architect, and also um, David Maiden, uh, which our friend we just interviewed, which is the CEO of a Server Density, and finally uh, Anthony Fox. Uh, which is director of data science at uh, CCRI. So go check it out. There's a lot of uh, good lessons to be learned in there. So, Yep. No, always love really interesting stories where people have moved from one place to another and why they did that. Um, super, super interesting stuff. Yeah, it's definitely war stories that, you know, there's failures in there and lessons in there that yep. you could learn so you can avoid them. So go check it out. Fantastic. Well, why don't we move on to our question of the week? Today's question of the week, uh, we want to talk about ping times. Yep. So uh, you're building your next amazing application, and you say to yourself, which regions should I put this in for Google Cloud Platform? Which ones are going to give me the lowest latency? Uh, so is there an easy way to be able to find out what my latencies could be? Not only there's an easy way, but it has an amazing name. <laughs> uh, it is GC Ping. So like GCP, but with ING at the end, yep. and which also it's ping, so you know, gcping.com. And it is a very simple service. Uh, it is created by, by somewhere working at Google, uh, Jason Hall. He just made this available. It's a very simple service. It has one F1 micro instance running every single one of our regions. And basically it just shows you the, the average ping time from your laptop or whatever you're using, maybe your phone, to all of those uh, instances. And it's pretty cool, because like for instance, right now, for me, I can see that uh, from San Francisco, the, the shortest ping is US West 1, which is, you know, not surprising. But I was actually slightly surprised that Europe West 1 is slightly longer than Asia East 1, which kind of makes sense, because Asia East is just the ocean, so we have a cable going through. Mm. But US West 1, there's actually you need to go through the United States and then through the oh, ocean. Oh, yeah. There's like mountains and stuff in the way. Yeah. So it kind of makes sense, right? But if you didn't think about it, it's like if I'm flying, actually, I'd say that Paris is shorter than uh, than Hong Kong. Mm. Apparently, that doesn't count. We that have doesn't cables. count. We have so, cables. Yeah. But one thing I really like about this is there's a global row in there. Oh, so yeah. what he does is he set up a global HTTP load balancer, which will then route the request to the nearest healthy instance. So what's neat about that is you can actually see that, okay, so for yeah, for me, again, same in San Francisco, US West 1, I get about 28 milliseconds. Um, 
and your mileage may vary for obvious reasons, but then my global is 31 milliseconds. So there's a small difference as it goes through the, the load balancer there of a few milliseconds, but you can pretty much determine where it's actually routed you to the correct place that is closest to you. Yeah, it is very cool because you can imagine that if you want uh, your instance to be accessible from, like your application to be accessible and fast everywhere in the world, yeah, you need to have a global HTTP load balancer. Mm. That that is the answer, basically. Yep, yep, yep. But if you are dependent on a specific region, just yeah, gcping.com, and you can see which one is the closest one. Cool. All right, Francesc, uh, where are you off to? What are you up to? What are you doing? So uh, I'm going to be recording one more episode. Actually, I just released an episode of uh, Just for Funk uh, again. So for those that do not know what Just for Funk is, is this YouTube series that I've been creating for quite a while now. And I just finished with Flappy Gopher. So now we have a like a clone of Flappy, uh, Flappy Bird running uh, completely in Go. Uh, mm -hmm. Pretty fun episode. It's I did. cute. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm going to be doing a next, another one uh, soon. But right after that, I'm going to China. I'm going to Shanghai to uh, speak at GopherCon China. And also uh, going to go, going to be running some workshops there. Uh, still not completely planned. But if you are in the region around Shanghai, uh, definitely check it out because I'll be trying to do some Go and Kubernetes workshops. Sweet. What about you? Uh, so I'm heading off to Vancouver. Uh, I'll be there for the week. I'll basically be working out of Vancouver uh, for a bit. Uh, but while I'm there, I'll be doing a Polyglot Vancouver talk. I'll be talking about gRPC and Kubernetes. Um, I will say if anyone's in Vancouver and there's stuff that you think I should check out or do or tech stuff or anything along those lines or presentations you might want made, uh, drop me a line. DMs are open on Twitter. Uh, outside of that, I will be at the East Coast Games Conference talking about game servers and Kubernetes. Uh, and then shortly after that, I will be at Vector. Uh, that will be from the 18th of April onwards. Nice. If yeah. you if you want things to do in, in Vancouver, I have some very good recommendations for restaurants. Uh -oh. So food is so good. <laughs> yes, Vancouver food is excellent. Yeah. Well, um, I think it's been a while since we have not done this. Okay. So, uh, but I'm going to try to reverse the roles this time. Ooh. So you're going to say where, and I'm going to say how. Okay. So what's the website? <laughs> <laughs> GCPpodcast.com. The email address? Hello at GCPpodcast.com. Twitter? At GCPpodcast. Reddit? Uh, slash R slash GCPpodcast. Uh, Google Plus? Plus GCPpodcast. Uh, Slack. Uh, oh wow, yeah, that one. That one's not gonna make it like that. Hash podcast. Hash podcast in the Google Cloud Platform community that you can access through bit.ly slash gcp dash Slack. Exactly what I said. Exactly. Uh, so there you go. If you have any proposals, questions, uh, we still looking for more questions on the week. Uh, we did last episode with that question of the week that was a recording from mm -hmm. someone. If you send us a recording with your question, we will definitely use it. That it is always fun to hear uh, our listeners. So send those our way. Uh, and um, as always, thank you, Mark, for yet another amazing episode. And thank you, Francesc, for joining me for yet another episode. And thank you all for listening. And we'll see you all next week. See ya.